There's a very famous line in John Newton's hymn, Amazing Grace, and it's, I was blind, but now I see. And maybe to an outside person, that would be confusing, but to a Christian, especially someone raised in the church, we understand. We're not talking about physical blindness. Each of us needs a savior. Each of us has walked in darkness. Each of us needs forgiveness. John Newton had an incredible story before he became a cleric. He had previously been the captain of a slave ship. He was an investor in the slave trade. He served as a sailor in the Royal Navy. And some years after becoming a Christian, Newton renounced slavery and became a prominent supporter of abolitionism. He was later ordained in the Church of England, and towards the end of his life, he became a very prolific hymn writer. John Newton was never physically blind, but he identified with the man in our story today. I was once on the wrong track. I once believed the wrong thing. I once did the wrong thing for a long time. I once was lost, and now I'm found. Blind, but now I see. Every week of our journey through the signs and wonders in John, we've also read Jesus' mission statement from Luke chapter 4, in which Jesus uses a quote from the prophet Isaiah to announce that he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Jesus reads, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And perhaps this miracle today will be a very literal miracle from Jesus' mission statement, right? I mean, he said he came to bring sight to the blind, and that's exactly what he did. A little background, uh, blind men back in Jesus' day, that wouldn't have been a great life. They generally would have sat along the roadside and just hoped that they could get enough money to survive that day. No employment, no prospects for marriage, no family, no honor. A blind person back then would have lived hour to hour. John 9 says, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. They asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he is born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, 
for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God, we know this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why, do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see me see, and those who see me become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. An entire chapter. We read an entire chapter of the Bible today. So that means we have a lot to cover, probably more than any of the other previous miracle stories. Specific stories like this one at least occur six more times in the Bible where Jesus stops and heals a blind person or he heals two blind people. But then we also have passages like Matthew 15 that says Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee and he went up on the mountain and sat down there and great crowds came to him bringing him the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute and many others. And they put them at his feet and he healed them. So that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they glorified the God of Israel. Which tells you what? Jesus fulfilled his mission statement all the time. The prophet Isaiah said, when the Messiah comes, he's going to heal the blind. The gospel writers want you to know, this guy Jesus, he healed the blind. <laughs> Indiana poet James Whitcomb Riley may have coined the phrase when he wrote, when I see a bird that walks like a duck and swims like a duck and quacks like a duck, I call that bird a duck. Too bad the religious leaders in this story can't make that same connection with Jesus. From all the things that he says and does, he sure seems to be the Messiah. And we'll come back to that, but first I want to highlight a few things from the story. And the first is, Suffering is not always a punishment for sin. The Bible says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. See, back then, the disciples, and probably most of the Jewish population, they lived under this impression that injury or illness is caused by sin, that you're suffering because of punishment, right? That makes sense because that's how you and I treat each other. If someone breaks the law, they're punished. We live in a very cause and effect world. So seeing the blind man, the disciples just figure, hey, somebody somewhere at some time blew it, right? Either him or his parents. The parents may have sinned in a way that caused physical harm to the baby. This is what happens with King David, right? King David sins with Bathsheba, and God says, because you did that, your baby will die. But that's the exception. That's not the rule. Today, we know that the world is full of people who are born with physical infirmities. Sometimes it's because the mother wasn't careful during her pregnancy, but the majority of the time, it's just nature. 
Plus, the Bible says the man was born blind. So, what does the disciple mean, who sinned? I really highly doubt that babies sin in the womb, right? That caused them to be punished. That would seem very harsh. But the flip side of that is, in Psalm 51, it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So, yes, we live in a polluted and decaying world that is corrupted both physically and spiritually by sin. You and I, we are not perfect. And as this passage says, we're not born perfect, and neither are we born into a perfect world. But even if it feels like it sometimes, I just want to stress that God is not necessarily punishing you for your sins. If you have a physical infirmity, if you feel like, even if you feel like you have bad luck, you know, and things just don't go your way, let me assure you, God loves you. So much so that he sent his son to be a curse for you. Job, there's a whole book in the Bible about this. Job did not understand his sufferings either. He, he did nothing to bring them on. He had no idea that his sufferings were a test. But even after all his complaining, he still kept his integrity with God. Because even though he didn't understand his sufferings, he still understood who had the power to save him. Jesus tells his disciples, this time it wasn't sin. He says, this time it was for glory. He said, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus used the opportunity of the man's blindness to display God's power, which leads me to the second point that we can learn from this in that, but suffering can be cured by Jesus. It may not be punishment, but it can be cured by Jesus. Hebrews 13 says, Jesus Christ is the, same, is the same yesterday and today and forever. God was not only limited to healing people's affirmities back then in the days of Jesus. He can still heal today. He still does heal today. He is not in the habit of doing supernatural things all the time, but that doesn't mean that he can't. We should pray for healing today. We can and should pray that God will still intervene, that God will still interact with people and bring about a physical healing who need it. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, I would encourage you, do it more often. Pray for the sick more often. Believe that God is just as powerful today as he was when he parted the Red Sea, as he was when he healed this man born blind in our passage. The Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. Ask, ask often, trust that God has the ability and that if he wills it, he will do it. But keep in mind that God knows what's best and he knows how best his power and will is displayed. So while we might pray for healing, we also understand that we are still leaving it in his hands. We're still leaving it in his will. You know, every now and then I think about how uh, great it would be or, or even fun it would be to live in another time period. You know, it, it, maybe the simpleness of growing up in the 50s or go back even further to the Victorian age. But before I get too lost in that fantasy, I'm rudely awakened when I think, well, nobody really wants to live before 1930 because... That's before the invention of penicillin. <laughs> and I certainly don't want to go back to a time when amputation was considered a cure or leeches. So say what you want about living in today's world, but God has really allowed us to advance with medical technology, even beyond what our grandparents would have ever thought. Entire diseases have been wiped out and where you have new medicines and new discoveries all the time. You know, when I go to a hospital and I see a doctor, I know that these people are gonna benefit from what God has done in the hands and minds of people who've been given gifts. And people 
uh, are even being healed of blindness today because of it. I thank God for medical technology. I thank God for doctors and nurses and surgeons and insurance and hospitals. Another lesson we can learn from this story is that even religious people can be blind. You know, the end of the story is so telling. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them, so they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. There is a vast difference in belief here from two radically different social classes, right? You have the Pharisees who would be highly educated and religiously superior, and they make this statement, this man isn't from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. So wait, he healed blindness. <laughs> he, healed, he healed blindness. He performed a miracle on the Sabbath so he can't be from God? But then we have the blind man, who I'm sure could not read or write, had very little education growing up, and he says, well, I believe he's a prophet. Who's right? The blind man. And then Jesus finds the man later and says, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. He goes, I'm convinced. You don't need to tell me twice. If it looks like a duck, right? This uneducated man is smarter than the religious leaders. And then, to really tighten that screw, Jesus says, for judgment I came into the world, and those who do not see me, and those who see me may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Jesus says, you know, of all the people that should know better, because you have access to the scriptures that most people don't, you all should have recognized me first, but maybe it's you that is blind. The Pharisees knew the Old Testament. They knew the traditions of their elders. They knew them inside and out. They could tell you what the scripture said on any topic. But they did not allow the knowledge of the Bible to change them. They were not humbled by the scriptures. They did not allow it to It didn't, they didn't allow the scriptures to, to, to help them focus because if you see the law as something that just needs to be obeyed and not as a means to humility, then it becomes impossible for you to need a Messiah. They are not looking for a personal Messiah who could rescue them. They were looking for an army general, a global Messiah. 1 Corinthians 8.1 says, All of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The Pharisees sure are puffed up, aren't they? They did not let their knowledge lead them to God. Instead, their knowledge led them to pride. 1 Corinthians 1 says, As the scriptures say, I will destroy human wisdom and discard their most brilliant ideas. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made them all look foolish and has shown their wisdom to be useless. A few verses later, Paul says, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God deliberately chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. That's exactly our story here, isn't it? Jesus used someone who had not studied to prove how much you know and believe. The only guy in this story 
who recognizes Jesus as the Messiah is blind. Now, that doesn't mean that Bible study and memorization and obedience is not important. Of course it is. But don't just become a person who knows the Bible. The Bible tells us about God. It brings others to God. Ultimately, we should be people who know God. The main purpose of the scripture is not to inform, it's to transform. The Bible should change your life and your spiritual eyes should open wider and wider as we grow. The last lesson is that spiritual blindness can also be cured by Jesus. You see, I think we're really remiss if we only see the story as a man who was healed of physical blindness. Yes, he opened the eyes of the man physically, but then he opened the man's eyes spiritually so that he could recognize the Messiah. The Pharisees decided the man is a liar and a loser and a sinner. Don't you just love the irony of uh, what this guy says after they're done questioning him? They, they say, you were steeped at sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? Remember how I said that people believed that sin was the cause of things like this, blindness? Well, here's a Pharisee reinforcing that by saying, this man was a sinner at birth. Well, they've conveniently forgot that they were too. And this is a really poor way to argue. When, when you can't answer what somebody else says, you change the, you, you turn the tables on them and you insult them instead. Jesus is truth, but they're not interested in finding truth. They're only interested in preserving their version of the truth. And I would even argue the Pharisees don't know their scriptures as well as they think. Isaiah says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for glory. When Jesus made a blind man see, as we saw earlier, he did it also for lots of people. He's fulfilling another aspect of the messianic prophecy. And you know, the Old Testament prophets, they performed miracles as well. Some of them healed, some of them multiplied food, but do you know what none of them did? There was not one prophet, then or since, who has ever healed the blind. Do you know why? Psalm 146 says, that the Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. Almost the same words as the scroll of Isaiah, but yet with one subtle difference. And this is what the Pharisees were blind to see. Not only did he heal the blind, yes, on the Sabbath, but only the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The miracle the miracle of curing blindness was the clearest affirmation that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the God-man. Yes, I believe that Jesus wants you to be healed, both physically and spiritually. But as we can see in this case of the blind man here in our passage, Jesus is more concerned about our spiritual health. Why? Because even people who have physical sight can be spiritually blind. And if you are not able to see spiritually, if you are not able to recognize that Jesus is Savior, if you are not able to recognize that you need to submit to him and his plan, then having perfect 2020 vision is useless. I'd say if you're still not someone who recognizes Jesus as Savior, that's something you need to continue to work on. The Bible is going to be your eye chart 
The church is going to be your doctor's office. Unless you think you're ready now. If you're ready to remove dark glasses, if you're ready to throw away the cane, if you're ready to follow Jesus from now on, then I would invite you to bow your head and pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so that I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin, from myself, and from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I want to repent and live the way you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with grace. I want to learn to love you, trust you, and become everything you made me to be. Thank you for creating me and choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer this morning, then I would invite you to plug into your local church. I know so many of us want to drive to the biggest, most fanciest, most expensive, maybe the most popular church, but it's your local church that needs you. You know, there's a community of people who live right in your area, your neighborhood, and they are doing their best to transform their world around them into a place that loves God and loves others. And chances are they need your gifts. They need the things that God has equipped you with. And so by plugging into a local church and giving them your time and your talent, you will begin to walk with Jesus more closely. And I, I guarantee you, your eyes will open wider more and more each day. I love you guys. We'll see you next week.